One of the things that I might have done better this, uh, during the day is navigate my way around different conversations, listen into as much as possible, and try and use everything I heard as a means of drawing the day together. Y you will appreciate that that's actually quite hard to do, and I basically gave up. <laughs> I, I didn't really try. Uh, to be fair, I didn't even try very hard. Um, and partly because I, I, I think it's impossible to do justice to the conversations you've been having, um, and it would be... Um, it would be a shame to reduce them to a few kind of clever quips or a few overheard statements. The justice that comes from the conversations you've been having, in part, now resides on your tablecloths and in the post-it notes. And I know that um, this is something which is going to be taken seriously. This is a learning conversation. It's an opportunity to shape and change the system. It may feel like it's just quite a nice way to idle away a Friday, and it's great to network, and yes, you'll hopefully go away with some concrete um, suggestions, proposals, ideas, motivations, but I do appreciate, especially if I'm honest, coming from England, how in this part of the world, there is a genuine commitment to listening to practitioners, leaders, um, and bringing that together to make sense of policy. And then an awareness that it's easy to write policy statements or professional standards, but the hard work begins when you try and make sense of those on the ground. And I, gen I always get a sense in Scotland that there's a commitment to really trying to make that work. The notion here of legacies matters. So I think what you're talking about here is, is, a, is a kind of an idea that there may be a legacy from today. You know, if you've been in the job even five years, you, you have lots of opportunities, hopefully, for networking, for professional de development, for learning more, for engaging in inquiry. And some of those will have profound impacts, but they have an impact because they are not just a one-off momentary um, activity. They have an impact because they, they can then be taken back into your world, and there's a legacy that can be built as a result. The question for me here is, how do we create these legacies? Legacies really matter, because otherwise, what are we doing any of this for? It's not about the next test result. It's not about whether um, you know, one, or well, it is about whether one child um, settles better in school than you might or might not have expected him or her to. Those things matter. But we're also in this for the long haul. And as a profession, the legacies that we create matter. Um, I, I'm going to just draw um, some parallels. It might feel a little bit um, contrived. I hope it doesn't feel too contrived. But there's, a, there's an indication of what the parallels are in that first uh, photograph. Before I was a geography teacher, I was an environmental scientist. As in, I have an environmental science degree. And then I became a geography teacher. And I had a choice. I had a choice at um, 21. I was offered the opportunity to do a PhD, or I was offered a place on a PGCE. The PhD was in peat bog reclamation. And I would have been more than happy to do it because I believed, and I still believe, that an environmental knowledge base is critical. Um, the reason I didn't do the peat bog reclamation PhD was because I could not bear the idea of standing on Thorn Waste in Yorkshire near Selby Power Station for months. And, and because I'd been there already on a field trip, it was cold, wet, and windy. And, and I thought, I, that's just not going to be me. I'm going to be lonely. I don't know if I'm going to keep my mojo going. I think it matters. It matters to me, but doesn't it matter enough to me? And actually, my best friend from university took that PhD and did a fantastic job and then, uh, you know, and has had a legacy from that learning. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because there was that point in time where I had to make a decision. And the decision was between something that was being offered to me on a plate, which was lovely, and something which was also being offered to me because I'd applied for it, but which was perhaps a little bit more unknown, but which I went for. I went for it for all sorts of reasons, and I'm really glad I did. But that conversation changed my mind, as in, no, I don't want to be an environmental scientist per se. I actually want to be an educator to support the work of environmental scientists through education. And that is a long time ago, long, long before um, Greta Thunberg came on the scene, who's doing a much better job than I could ever have done. But there was a legacy. There's a legacy of that degree. And part of the legacy of that degree 
um, as well as that conversation, was the way I see the world. And all of us as teachers, what's wonderful about the teaching profession is that we come into it with these multiple disciplines, with these various hats on, whether we've been working in other professions before, whether we've been done a degree in the arts, the humanities, the sciences, whether we've done an education degree, but which is different from somebody else's education degree, which we were drawn into for our own personal reasons. We must be one of the most diverse professions. And one of the things which we ought to make the most of is that disciplinary knowledge base, not do I know more history than you do, but as a, as a historian, how is my cognition, how is my understanding, how is the way I process, how is the way I understand things of value to this diverse and exciting profession? And how do, when I talk about it, how does that make a difference to how the scientists or the mathematicians view the world? And actually, as a profession, drawing on that would perhaps be a very valuable thing. We do it inadvertently, but perhaps we need to do it more deliberately. But I'm drawing on it now simply because I want to use it as a metaphor. So I, am, uh, I was an environmental scientist, and I sometimes look at schools. I mentioned that I look at education often as a landscape. I look at schools through an environmental science lens, and I look at the system through that lens. And some of the ways I understand the world and the work that you do as practitioner inquirers, as school leaders, as coaches, is through that lens. One of the ways of understanding the environment is by looking at the cultures of that environment. And this is an interesting picture for me, because often as educators and as human beings, if you like, we see culture as the rich, vibrant, um, dynamic part of life. Actually, culture can also mean this. It can mean a monoculture. This is a singular crop in a vast field. But an environmental scientist would look, look at that as a, it's an agriculture, which is based on a monoculture. So let's remember that actually there are things about culture that we want to preserve, protect, and develop. But not everybody will have that same sense of culture. So some people would see culture as something which is really quite monolithic and needs to be contained and sustained in a singular fashion. This is how we do it here. Don't you come in there with your new ideas. Don't you come in there with your ideas on diversity. Don't you come in, in there with your wider repertoire than we need. This is our culture. That's extraordinarily unsustainable, unless you only want to preserve that culture. That is not education. That is not representative of what we need. So let's be sure that when we introduce ideas like it's important to build this into the culture, that we don't at the same time allow for a reductive view of those ideas. We need to keep expanding our view of those ideas. So when you think, so I guess what, inevitably, there are going to be more questions. Questions to take away with you. As you individually, you at your school level, as, a, as local authorities, as, as, a, as, a, as a nation, build on this work, it is worth asking yourselves more questions. Keep yourself in check, if you like. Use these as an audit tool. So when you think about culture, when you think about the work you do as a practitioner inquirer, when you think about the work you might do as a coach or a mentor with early career teachers or more experienced teachers, actually, what is the impact of that work on the culture that you are creating for learning? What is the culture you're trying to create for learning? And is that the culture that's being generated? Is there an impact? And is the impact one which is embracing a diverse culture, a rich culture, or is it one that is narrowing the culture and actually potentially causing more problems down the line? So culture, I think, is a really important thing. It's come up a lot, but keep questioning what we mean and what we're developing through that. Another aspect of environmental science, one that is um, critical in our understanding of how the world ticks, is that we have a very diverse ecosystem, or many types of ecosystem which is with, within which there is lots of diversity. We know that in environmental terms, it is diversity that is often at risk. We take that idea of diversity and we translate that into education, then we need to again question what do we mean when we use words like diversity, because they're often delivered as, if you like, the challenge We've got a diverse population of learners here. That's the challenge. 
we've got a diverse population of teachers here, that's the challenge. Well, actually, the diversity is the strength. The diversity is what makes it work well. And the worry is when you lose the diversity. In my view, don't forget, not everybody will agree. Frequently, they don't. Um, so again, as you move on, recognize that this room is full of interested people. This room is the people who thought, I will make that effort. I can get permission to go. This aligns with the things I'm interested in and I'm responsible for. I will try and take something away with me that will make a difference. But we also always run the risk in rooms like this or on Twitter hashtags or whatever it is of talking to like-minded people, and that's great, but not thinking about the diversity that actually we then face when we go back into the real world. And that if we worry about that diversity as a challenge, as a barrier, as an obstacle, because they're not all like me, then we're not dealing with the real world. We're also not recognizing the richness to our working worlds, to our education system that that diversity brings. So as you start to continue to develop, start to continue, as you continue to develop practitioner inquiry, as you think about the role of conversation, coaching, et cetera, within that, this question about diversity matters. How confident are you that you are, at a basic level, meeting diverse professional learning needs? Not everybody is you, just like not every child is Johnny. So what are you going to do to ensure that the work you do continues to build, embrace, and make the most of the diversity that you have within the profession, rather than kind of create this constraint in relation to that diversity? So a really good question to ask yourselves is actually, has this enriched the learning experience of others? Not just people like me, not just those who I've kind of groomed and mentored and coached to think like me, but everybody else. That sounds quite nasty. That's not what I meant. But there we go. So diversity. Another aspect of environmental science, again, you know, one that I would have engaged with seriously for three years at Sheffield University, is the whole notion of the environment is driven by systems. So things like the water cycle, things like the weather system, these systems create change, movement, they create ecosystems, they create all sorts of dynamic elements in our environment. And the education world is no different to that. And of course, one of the difficulties with that is that systems can often seem out of reach. We can seem like we feel like we're a tiny, tiny part of a big system over which we have no control. And that can happen even at school level. You know, so actually, let's not worry about the whole all the time. Let's not moan all the time about what the system is doing to us. Let's actually recognize that systems in the real world, the environmental world, and in, in our world as educators, are, are um, influenced by tiny changes, the ripple effects in those systems. Um, so we know, for example, in the environmental world, that if we deforest a hillside and we leave the soil exposed and then you have a rainstorm, more of the soil will wash away because it's no longer protected and the chances are that will land up in the streams and the rivers, which will then have less capacity to actually hold the water, which will cause more flooding. Plus, you've got a denuded landscape in terms of the soil quality. That's not a very positive ripple effect. It's easier to spot the negative ones, isn't it? Well, if only we hadn't done that. Or I can't do that now because that's happened. That's having an effect. Actually, one of the benefits of things like practitioner inquiry and coaching is that you are potentially generating positive ripple effects. They may seem tiny, and we can be hugely anxious all the time about whether I've told enough people about my fantastic inquiry that really demonstrated to me that this was worth doing. Does everybody know? Is everybody now developing their understanding and their repertoire as a result? We could be worrying about that forever. Worry about it at the tiny ripple effect stage. Is the one conversation you have with your partner teacher going to help them see something that they hadn't had insight into before? Is the one conversation that you have with the school leader going to lead to that school leader having a conversation with the governors? or changing the way that they understand you as a professional. The ripple effects that we have can be really positive. So let's celebrate those, let's find them, let's make sure that we have it, like, don't just proclaim stuff, you know, isn't it fantastic, I've transformed the outcomes for these P3 children simply by doing more digital learning. Probably not. 
you might have changed something in their capacity, you might have included them, they might have been more participatory, they may have been all sorts of things. You haven't transformed everything, but you are having a ripple effect. Find them and celebrate them, check the evidence for them, and then think who, who needs to know. Because let's be honest, even if you think the world needs to know, the world isn't listening. You can't have everybody's ear. You can't expect it. You can have a few people paying attention to what you're doing. So who needs to know? What matters most? Don't do yourself down because you're just a teacher. The just a teacher will have a colleague. And they might be the right person to understand the ripple effect and to then create their own ripple effects. So systems might seem like massive things, like the weather system, but they are all in many ways influenced by these tiny, tiny changes, nuanced ripple effects. So look for them and do them well. We often think about scale, and we worry about scale. So how do we do this at scale? How do we make this happen for more people? How do we scale up the impact? How do we do all of that? And as an environmental scientist, scale matters. This is a photograph uh, taken by an electron microscope, I think, of a rock. It's a rock thing. I did spend quite a lot of time in geology labs looking down microscopes. This is the sort of image I'd be looking at. Tiny, tiny scale. So we often ask, how do we scale up? It's really worth asking, how do we scale down as well? Because we can scale everything up, we can have wonderful policies, we can have people on board, we can restructure, we can do this, we can do that. None of that works until the person at the lowest scale, the person, the individual, has the capacity and the motivation and the drive and the knowledge and the confidence and the support to do things. At scale is nonsense if you ignore the individual. It's complete nonsense. There's no such thing. So let's not just ask how do we scale up, but let's actually ask how do we scale down. That matters. And we're nearly finished. Again, another concept in environmental science is the notion that over time, at different time scales, organisms and the ecosystems adapt. So here's a fox. Foxes were not... If, um, you know, they weren't originated on this planet to be urban creatures, but they are. They are entirely adapted to urban life. You might think that's great, you might not think that's great. It's a good example of adaptation. We have to ask ourselves, what adaptations are happening? So our landscape is the world in which we work. Our education landscape is extraordinarily complicated. If you are busy doing work like practitioner inquiry, ask yourself first, is this just keeping me busy? Is this just a, another box to tick? Is this just something to give me, a, you know, a, 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 something to talk about at my next interview? I am convinced by the people in the room that that's not the motivation. But you do have to be confident that there is a landscape out there that's worth changing. If it's not worth changing, why are we trying to do this work? And actually, how is the work that you're doing starting to change the landscape? That might seem like a contradiction, because I've said don't worry about the big scale all the time. But actually, what, if, what is happening? What are you feeding out? What is beginning to shift? How is the conversation that you're able to have today different to the conversation you might have had five years ago if you'd all been in this room with the same questions? If you come back in five years' time, how is the work that you're doing adapting your understanding and therefore the conversations that you can have in five years' time? And again, this notion of it matters that each of us believes we're doing good work and doing it well, but it also matters that each of us feel that we belong and are part of a profession that is continuing to become something up to the demands of the job. So how does the work we do shape the landscape of education and how does the profession become part of that rather than be a slave to it. I think we, ha we have that in England, I think, too much. Maybe not so much here. So ask yourselves about adaptation. And I think that's the key. Well, uh, it's a bit grand for me to just say that's the answer because all I asked was questions. The key thing here for me is we, we want 
legacy. We want to know that what we're doing now makes a difference, that it makes the world a better place, that our value is real, that our learners gain enormously. Not that our education system sits at the top of a global scale, league table, that's probably the least relevant thing, but that it actually makes a difference to those people who are learning with us at this point in time and those people who will be learning with us when we're still in the profession in 5, 10, 15 years' time. So the, the other kind of grand thing here is to just keep in mind, how do we make this sustainable? And again, people have referred to things like that on the post-it notes and in the conversations you've had. And it's a hard, hard question. But you can't do it by just layering on more workload. But you also can't do it by saying, let's just carve out a corner of time. We'll just give this another hour every week. We'll just direct people to do this as a, you know, a project. That's not sustainable. That's a project. Actually, the questions about legacy are based on the difficulty of making things sustainable. The real benefit here is that none of us are having to do it on our own. Even if you're working in a tiny, tiny, tiny rural school as possibly the single practitioner, you're not on your own. And we, none of this is possible unless we work collaboratively together. And that, that's, again, sounds like a very kind of generalized, sweeping statement. But if you ask yourself, is this possible unless we work collaboratively, the answer probably has to be no. But the question then becomes, how do we do that in a way where we actually compromise our, we don't rather compromise our ability to, to keep coming to work, to keep doing our job well. We can't simply ask for more. But what we can do is say, what does the thing that we're doing contribute that allows us to rethink the ambitions of our educational landscape and the policies that we need to support that? I think that's the end. Yes. So ask yourself that. How are you going to create a sustainable legacy of learning? This is the, a very good place to be. But those are the questions that matter. Thank you.